That's right. That's it. <laughs> Thank you for uh, coming again. We are still in Athens. Uh, we have the contemporaries back here observing, and we have those that we brought forward from the fifth century. Uh, and uh, long before that, Theseus is eternal, so from the beginning of time. Uh, today, what we'll have is a presentation by each of the uh, characters, followed by a, uh, an interchange among them, and then questions from the audience. We start with Theseus, the eternal Theseus. I'll let him explain his character. They call me the father of democracy. They say that I brought forth the institution of potsherds to ensure a secret ballot. They say I'm the father of democracy because I rid Athens of the aristocracy. They say that a jealous king, a jealous king kicked me off the cliff on the island of Skyros. To my death, they say, and that my bones were rediscovered and brought back to Athens. They say that. They say I died. Those who say, those who say are mere mortals. Those who say these things, how dare they? For I am Theseus, and in my veins flow the blood of a god, Poseidon. And when they tell my stories since time immemorial, when they tell those stories, they tell of my deeds. They tell of slaying the bull of Marathon. They tell of me leading the army against the Amazons who are about to destroy our city. They tell these stories. They tell how I entered the labyrinth, and with my bare hands, only my bare hands, I slew the Minotaur, the Minotaur who had been taking our best children, our sons and daughters, in tribute. They tell these stories how I, Theseus, with the blood of the God in me, who walks with the gods and the mortals. They say how I prepared the world and made it safe for the mortals. They say how I, with the other gods and the other heroes, made the world. They say that. How we brought forth the institutions and the laws. They say that. They say how we, when we tell our stories, the world is rejuvenated and made meaningful. They say those things, and the blood of a god runs through my veins. But I was conquered. I was conquered not by a sword, not even by a spell, not by deeds of valor. I was conquered by potsherds and an alphabet etched in stone. I was conquered. I was conquered. I was conquered by those who turned their backs from the gods and the heroes, who no longer looked to the ancestors for wisdom. I was conquered by those who now rested responsibility for knowing the world on their own shoulders. I was conquered by those who saw only that which was filtered through their senses through their eyes and their touch. I was conquered by those who chose to stay inside the cave shackled to the wall. From the oral traditions to the written world, to the written word, the alphabet. From the sovereignty and power of the gods and heroes to the sovereignty of man, democracy. 
I was transformed like the world was transformed from a place of mythos in which the gods rule, in which truth came from the authority ordained by the gods, to a world that became logos, to a world which truth was discovered by the minds of man, man-made democratic. They say I'm the father of democracy, but how could it be? Why would I give birth to my own destruction? They say that. They say that. I am Theseus, now mortal, now dead. What was it that brought this destruction? What was it that we gained in the name of democracy? Thank you, Theseus, the hero and father of Athens, and as a hero, an intermediary between mere mortal and the eternal gods. More, quote, down to earth, end quote, is the great teacher Socrates, the teacher of Plato, the not so handsome man who had an eye for women, who was a good friend of Aspasia, the courtesan who probably controlled Pericles at the, during the golden age of Athens. So it is, then we turn to the father of the, of the Socratic process, Socrates. Who am I? I am Socrates. You know me by legend. You've heard of my death at the hands of my fellow Athenians. I was the son of a stonecutter, and I learned that craft. But I, I chose not to live as a stonemason. I spent my days wandering the streets, always in the city. The country held no joy for me. The country is a natural place, but not where men are gathered. And for me, man was the measure of, of things important. When I began my quest to find the answers for what is good, I undertook what became a lifelong pursuit, a pursuit that ended, in fact, my life. It became a pursuit that, when confronted with the choice of saving my own existence or staying true to the principles which I had espoused, to question all things, I chose to pursue my own demise rather than to bow to the will of a duly authorized vote of my constituent peers in the, in the Athenian governing body. But perhaps more than discussing who I am, the question today should be, of course, who are you? And why, in fact, are we here? And let me then address those to each of you and to those seated in the cafe. And we will talk again at a street corner when we meet. All in the context of today's question, the individual or the group, as you see, each came to their own demise as they promoted the concept of open thinking, of democracy. And the mother of Plato was Perctione, and she was 
very pragmatic. She knew, quote, the place of women in Athens, so she used it. And in her salons, where she had the great philosophers and artists, she was able to become even more powerful and made it clear that she kept the home harmonious. And by keeping the home harmonious, she had males very dependent upon women. Very interesting. She also was a mathematician. And mathematicians, as you know, are the salvation of the world. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Bell. I appreciate that. My name is Kirk Dion. If you know me at all, you know me as Plato's mother. Yet, I was a philosopher, a published philosopher, one of the Pythagoreans. In my day, they held us in mild derision. The idea that a woman would be a philosopher was a joke. They wrote comedies about Pythagorean women. We watched them. We ignored them. They really had nothing to do with our lives. I wrote two books, Sophius, which means wisdom, and On the Harmony of Women. I am quoted by Stobius, by Apollonius of Tyre, and by several others. And yet you ask, why haven't I ever heard of Perkdion before? Well, recall that Athens was at war. And many times when the conquerors came in, they would destroy the libraries. So only fragments of my work remain. And the later historians, I notice coming up to this century, were primarily men. And when men read things, they assumed they had to be written by men if they made sense. And so the name Perkdion had to be a pseudonym or a mythical woman. It could not possibly have been written by a woman because it's always his story, not her story. So that is why you probably don't know much about me. Let me tell you a little about my life. I was born an aristocrat. I am descendant of Poseidon. Quite possibly, Theseus here is one of my ancestors. Solon, the lawgiver of Athens in 594 BCE, was also one of my ancestors. So I was very, very blue-blooded. And as a blue-blooded young maiden, when I went out, I always had chaperones. But even you ladies today know what we do with chaperones, don't you? We always sneak. There was a young man by the name of Ariston who was interested. He had a good bloodline, but I really didn't like him, so I turned down his first proposal. Until a few months later, I found myself pregnant. So we got married, and we had a son by the name of Aristocles. You know him as Plato. That was his nickname, you know. He was the broad one. He was a wrestler. I also had two other sons and a daughter by the name of Platon. And soon their father, Ariston, died. And I became married to Pyrolamps, who was my uncle. And you're sitting there going, oh my goodness, she's like Antigone. Yet you must understand, in Greece, you many times were married to your relatives in order to keep the land and the family. So that is what happened. And I lived happily in Pyrolamp's house in Athens. Aspasia was one of my contemporaries, and she starred at the salons where men and women would come to discuss their ideas and beliefs. So I also started having salons in my home. That is where Plato was introduced to Socrates, most likely. Socrates may deny that. Also, the Pythagoreans began showing up at my salons. And that is where I was first exposed to their way of life. Soon time went on, and Athens had lost the war with Sparta. This left a political vacuum in our city. And what happened? My uncle, Critias, 
led the 30 tyrants in overthrowing the Democrats. They slaughtered 1,500 Democrats, exiled 5,000, seized their property. <coughs> I was in shock. My son Plato and I and my daughter Patone fled. Patone and I went to one of the Pythagorean colonies, probably near Corinth or southern Greece, and we began to study. Now, as a Pythagorean, I gave up my wealth. I gave that to the good of the group. I became a vegetarian. My days were spent in meditation, study, and exercise because I was going to become one of those who practice philosophus, or the love of learning, because through that, you gain wisdom. And with wisdom, you can also apply the great principle of life, which is harmonia. Harmonia is the principle that applies to all things. You know harmony in music. There also must be harmony in the universe, harmony in your life, harmony in your home. Now, the woman's place is in the home, and it is her duty, her responsibility to her husband, to her children, to her servants, even to the foreign visitor to maintain that harmony. And that is what I brought out in my book on the harmony of women. That was their place. Now you'll notice that as a woman philosopher, I'm a realist. I know that things ought to be different. Women ought to be fully equal as the Pythagoreans believed, but that simply was not the way it was in our society. So my philosophy was to apply harmonia the way things actually existed. Now, when I look at classes, there's nothing really wrong with being an aristocrat or being wealthy, but there are many women out there who will go and buy the scents from India, buy the gold of Egypt, really dress extravagantly. They are the ones who are going to defile their marriage bed. They are the ones who are going to lie and deceive their husbands. They will cause disharmony in their lives and the lives of the people around them. Let me tell you that that type of power and position and wealth causes malice, causes treachery. It is not good. In conclusion, let me tell you that women should be philosophers because only women understand the restrictions that society places on them. And thus, and so, this concludes the formal presentation of the panel. And I believe that I'd like to ask Antigone for a reaction, if you will, to all the comments, any of the comments, the whole day. Uh, first of all, I would, I just noticed something very interesting in meeting Perictaion for the first time. Plato, her son, we just met her rather bumptious son a little bit earlier, and he had never once mentioned his mother in any of his works, but I see strains of Perictaion in the Republic. What is that but a society that is completely harmonious? <laughs> Why, thank you. I don't think, I don't think she means that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> and Socrates, in your wisdom, uh, do you think uh, Perktion uh, was a positive influence on your uh, student or uh, otherwise? He seldom spoke of his mother, which is not surprising one would assume since we were talking philosophy, and philosophy and women seldom are thought of in the same light, although it's an interesting construct. <laughs> hmm. I, I, I'm so intrigued, well, but. Go ahead. You're intrigued. I, I was intrigued by the prospect of a, of a woman Pythagorean. Uh, 
was it not so that uh, the followers of Pythagoras would not speak for several years? And if so, how is that possible of a woman? And, and would you speak of that now? I will certainly address that. Sometimes. My wife would speak for you, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, just give me a moment, please. You must understand that, yes, as Pythagoreans, we had to remain silent for five years. But what that meant was that when we went to the lectures of Pythagoras, we had to remain silent. We could not espouse our own views until we had passed our probationary period. And I obviously passed my probationary period because he allowed me to become published. I wonder when that tradition ended, because all the math students I know don't let the teacher do that. Very interesting. How about the intermediary to the gods, Theseus? Uh, what think you of the comments of the two women? Entertaining. As one who has walked with gods, I'm elated that those who follow as mortals try to emulate us. It's good. Of course, it's all doomed to failure. But it's fun to watch from my vantage point as they toy with this system of government or that system of government. All of which that they have pro professed here today are doomed for failure because they deny their relationship with the gods and the heroes. They've turned their backs on us. Antigone did not turn her back on the gods. She was an instrument of the gods. In fact, Antigone feels quite a strong thread running between Theseus and herself. No pun intended, Theseus. Uh, <laughs> she died to honor the rites as ordained by the gods. And let me state also that Perktion considered the worship of the gods second only to the proper respect and courtesy to one's parents. Why? Now, <laughs> Why? <laughs> simply because the greatest sin one could ever commit would be to show disrespect to one's parents, living or dead. That is something that is part of your responsibility as a child is to always support one's parents and also therefore to support one's gods who were taught to you by your parents. So the truth then comes from others? Pythagoras maintains the truth while his students must remain silent and receive only his thoughts and words. Do I misinterpret what you say? Quite possibly. Uh, please understand that I do it often. That is fine. Um, whenever you are supporting your parents, you may correct them, but you may in no way disrespect them. You may tell them that perhaps they need to think in a different manner. You are not getting the truth from them. You are still searching for it yourself. And I wonder, from our contemporary cafe, who are all the youth of the future, what think you of these comments about parents? We spent a lot of money to bring these people forward. I think these comments are of the gods and we can't decipher what they mean in this day and time. <laughs> Do you not have parents in this day and time? Yes, but not of virtue. What does that mean? You speak ill of your parents. They lack the qualities that we've seen in the past. Hmm. And what is virtue? Virtue is the choice that one makes 
to become what he is. Out of the, out of the mouths of. <laughs> the unexamined life is not worth living and is true. And obviously you are examining yours and that is, that is certainly to your benefit. I hope the gods grant you favor in your, in your quest. What's interesting as you, if you followed this all day, as some of us have, that both models require people to talk, think, interact, and each challenges the individual to become insightful. But why would one model be better than the other to preserve a society where we don't tear each other apart. Theseus. There is a model, a model that has been here since time immemorial, handed down from the gods and the intermediaries, the heroes, They've set the standards, they set the way, they set an understanding to go through the labyrinth of life with a way out. What concerns me in our dealings today, in our discussions today, in these words of mortals, focuses on what system best serves the rights of individuals. It's at the premise of tonight's discussion aristocracy or democracy, which best serves the rights of individuals. The premise of the question itself has to be examined closely, it seems to me. The rights of the individual. What are the rights of the individual? And I suspect that with this very learned panel, insights can be had and we should explore those. My concern though, focuses on the emphasis of the individual, separate and autonomous, separate and autonomous from the gods and from the heroes. There are many systems that can address the rights of the individuals, and there may be one that is better suited for the rights of the individual. But the rights of the individual then, are they to supersede the rights of the gods and the heroes? The relationship we have with the larger cosmos around us? Are we to shift our emphasis away from that relationship in which we are a part of the cosmos, that when the stories of Theseus are told, we are part of that reality and that world is made meaningful? We shift the way of knowing the world from anam anamnesis, of knowing the world and its totality to a world in which we think we can know it all separate from the gods. And that's what concerns me, is that premise there. Which means, Antigone, the question to you then. Here's the question. If crayon represents the word of the gods, why would your individual choice to do what you wanted not threaten what he's proposing, and that is the words of the gods should dominate? because Crayon's words did not represent the words of the gods. Crayon's words represented the words of civil authority. It was my stand that honored the gods in our lives. That's why when I say I support democracy, I was taking a rather <laughs> tenuous stand on that issue because Antigone's primary responsibility and her primary s support and focus would have been that of piety, that of following and respecting those ceremonies as ordained by the gods. So it was not crayon. I, I'm curious. Antigone and troubled in part. I'm thinking still of our contemporary, and I know not this contemporary scene, the ways of youth in any age have 
always caused me consternation is your son's wrestling career, for example, did in Plato's case. But Antigone, our young friend has decried the lack of virtue in the family. And as I think of your family, yourself from incestuous union, yourself condemned to death for not once but twice violating the authenticated rule of law of the state. Is there the possibility that all families are dysfunctional? Can there be virtue within the family unit? Uh, virtue must be taught by developing virtues from an early age and actually developing specific virtues. You will then cause other virtues to come forth. Know that harmonia is the thing of all things. That is necessary to exist. And those virtues, again, must be taught. They must be practiced. And in today's society, what I'm seeing in your 1998 is that perhaps those virtues have not been taught enough. They have not been developed enough. So perhaps more emphasis needs to be placed on this in the homes and in the schools. Now, let's give the ultimate test the ultimate test. We've been through this all day today. And again, I'd like to turn to our contemporaries. The question to you is, each one of you, what's more important, the rights of the individual or the society as a whole? These are the questions you will have to answer as we pass on. There's no right or wrong answer, it's just your answer. I think the rights of society, because um, when a lot of turmoil comes along, as if you act as one, a whole bunch of people act as one, you can do more together than one individual by itself, themselves. Steve. <laughs> the question to you again is, What's more important, the individual or the society as a whole? I would say the society as a whole. And how would you say this should be uh, performed through the laws? Should the laws be prescriptive in the sense that they tell you as an individual what you can and cannot do? Or should they be less restrictive? I think they should be less restrictive. But then how does that fit with the concept that society should be in control? Well, it depends on what, society, what you're doing in society. OK, let's bring another student forward. Come. This is truly what this process is all about. If we don't ask the youth of the future what they think of everything we've been doing today, what's it for? Most of us won't be here in 20 years, some of us. So where are you, as an individual, you personally, well, how do you feel about your individual rights versus the rights of the state of Idaho? Which should dominate? I feel, I guess, that the individual is important. Um, each individual has so much um, control over what happens in their lives that, that I feel that's very important. Um, society can't make decisions for you. You have to make decisions for yourself. So I feel the rights of individuals is more important. And so what do you think of this concept that democracy is a meeting first and then a vote? And so what of that? Please repeat the question. <laughs> for $60. <laughs> the question is, Someone says, democracy is truly first a meeting and then a vote, the implication being that the vote will decide the action of the group. What do you think of that? The vote is good for the action of the group, 
but the individuals who are overlooked become the last people to represent their side of the history or the story or whatever we're entailing. So you're concerned about? I'm concerned about the individual being mm -hmm. overlooked and overwhelmed by the, the group's answer to what, he's, to what he's going to end up, where he will be when the answer has come in. So in the context of democracy as we know it, who do you agree with, Antigone or Plato? Sure. You're not sure. That's an I, answer. I think the individual. The individual, which would be more on Antigone's side, yes? And so what do you think the fact that the Idaho legislature is now trying to decide the future rights of women relative to the concept, uh, not the concept, or the, what is it, uh, of abortion, the right to have abortion or not? What do you think, there, what, should, what should the legislature be doing about this? Involved in it or not involved in it? As far as deciding whether or not it's okay? Yes. Um, that's a tough issue. Um, I think the state as a whole has a right to have an opinion about it, and I think maybe it is something that should be voted upon. Um, uh, that's such a tough issue. Yes, it is. That's why you're young. <laughs> and so what about the fact that the legislature decides whether or not you should be taxed for something you'll never use? Is this correct? You know, there are many taxes you will pay that you'll never use. <laughs> yes, that's, that's part of uh, being in a group or a community. It's not an individual. Um, yeah, I'm a, a parent. My son will be going to school, but I know there's a lot of people out there that aren't parents don't feel that they shouldn't have to pay these taxes for these new schools. But as a community, we do need these new schools. I'd like each character to come behind one of the students, if you would. And place your hand on them. There you go. A hero can do two. <laughs> <laughs> it would be my hope that the wisdom of 5,000 years would come to each one of you and help you in, as you say, these are tough questions. I'd like you to give them a, a round of applause, please. <laughs> and now, out of character, we'll go with Socrates, who you are. I am George Ives. I teach English and Humanities here at the college and occasional journalism class as well. And Theseus. Uh, Rodney Fry with Lewis Clark State College, anthropologist. Um, <laughs> this was really a stretch, but appreciate it very much. <laughs> and Perpteon. Uh, I'm Amelia Phillips. I teach archaeology and computer science here at NIC. And uh, finding information about Perpteon was definitely a challenge. <laughs> I'm Ron Bell. I'm the interim president saying that this, this has been a thrill and a pleasure, and thank you all for coming today. Thank you. You guys did a great job. I didn't think you could sit back here and not do it. That's it. Goodbye.